All right, I think it's uh, 4.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Louise McCullough today, who is going to be our guest speaker. We're very fortunate to have her here. She um, is coming to us from uh, Houston Medical School, where she's uh, recently taken the position as professor and chair there of the Department of Neurology. Um, I didn't even know that until uh, this uh, you arrived at it, because I think of you as being from Connecticut, where I've seen you for a number of years. Um, and, um, and, and it seems you hail, or maybe not originally, but you did your uh, undergraduate work at the University of Connecticut and your PhD in neuroscience at the University of Connecticut, and then your residency at Johns Hopkins um, in neurology, where you were chief resident. Um, and has gone on to be a real leader in the field of neuroimmunology, has been involved in a number of clinical trials for stroke, has had a particular interest in uh, the role of um, uh, age and of, uh, uh, of gender's not the right word, Where sex, sex <laughs> in, uh, in uh, development of uh, stroke outcomes. Um, and uh, I recently had a chance to see her speak about uh, translational models of stroke at the stroke meeting just a few months ago, and she has just an incredible wealth of experience in this area, which was really helpful to all of us who are working in this field. So um, I am going to uh, then let her go ahead and get started to talk about translational stroke research. Age and sex do matter. Excellent. Thank you. And I'm trying really hard not to be redundant with yesterday's talk, which was kind of more clinical, and I know some of you guys were there, and you know. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some, some clinical stuff. Um, but I'm going to focus this one really on translational stroke, which is modeling in the laboratory, and how we can improve it. As you guys may know, there's been a series of failed trials for um, neuroprotection or restorative therapy. And it's not just stroke. We kind of get down on stroke, but it's the same with Alzheimer's and other things. We just don't really have very effective treatments. So the question is, why are our targets not very good? Part of it could be our animal modeling and the way we model things in the lab. And I think one of the biggest problems is that we often don't have clinicians talking with basic scientists because a lot of the trials that have failed are kind of almost predicted to, to fail if you think about it. All right, yeah, so I was in Connecticut for a really long time with a little sojourn and Mike Williams. Great to see you from Hopkins. Yeah, after about a decade at Hopkins, I went back to Connecticut, so I'm kind of a Northeast native, so I'm adjusting to Houston, which is incredibly humid. But if you've ever been to the TMC, um, the Texas Medical Center, it really is amazing. It's like a city unto itself and there's amazing resources there. So I'm hoping that it will really help our group kind of um, move our research forward. So you guys know this. I know some of you are residents and fellows, but um, and I showed this yesterday, just looking at the epidemiology of stroke and um, stroke in women, which is kind of where my clinical interests lay, is there's really three types of stroke. I think you guys are disproportionately seeing intracerebral hemorrhage here as a referral center. Um, and actually, intracerebral hemorrhage is growing, um, mostly because the aging of our population. Um, you know, as you guys know, ICH should really Really, what's the two things, two big risk factors for intracerebral hemorrhage? Hypertension. So if they have a, like this is a, oops, a deep, um, a deep bleed with intraventricular extension. So these are often related to hypertension. What's the other? Amyloid. So and that's becoming more and more common. Amyloid angiopathy because it's an age-related disease. And a huge number of patients on autopsy will have some evidence of amyloid angiopathy. Those um, hemorrhages will usually be more cortical. Um, they're often recurrent. Um, we know that blood pressure does also contribute to those, uh, but it's really just abnormal amyloid in the vessels. Um, not too much of a sex difference in intracranial hemorrhage. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, yes, there is a little bit of a female predominance, and aneurysm growth has been linked to estrogen. Um, and then the vast majority of strokes, which we study in the lab, are uh, ischemic. And this is a uh, subacute to, you know, probably day-old left MCA stroke. So this is what we study, and I'll explain our mouse model. Um, so just speaking about sex and stroke. So you're right, gender is gender is what you're perceived. You perceive yourself as male or female. If they talk about gender roles, it's like mom being home with kids and maternal. So sex is biology. So sex is XX or hormones or gonads or whatever. That's sex difference. So a gender difference may be that, you know, women are perceived, 
maybe don't get seen as quickly in the emergency room. That, that might be a gender difference. So probably both exist in stroke. Um, it turns out gender differences are really that gap is <coughs> narrowing. The women get TPA just as often as men. They get seen just as quickly as men. Sometimes they don't come to the ER as quickly as men, mostly because they'll minimize their symptoms or they live alone. So if you're aphasic or you fall down, you know, and you're alone and nobody's there to see you, you may have a delay getting to the hospital. About one in five women will have a stroke in their lifetime, whereas one in six men. Um, in most age groups, though, like I told you guys yesterday, if you're there, most age groups, males have a greater ischemic sensitivity. So if you have a boy and a girl <laughs> that have like a neonatal or hypoxic ischemic injury or have a stroke in the neonatal or pediatric period, the boy does worse. They have higher mortality and they have higher neurobehavioral deficits from their stroke. Um, however, more women overall have stroke because we live longer. And the stroke rates in women really skyrocket after menopause. Um, and those women are very high rates for bad outcomes. So they have bad cognitive outcomes, they have more post-stroke cognitive disability, they're more likely to end up in a nursing home. Okay, and you guys stop me if you want because this is pretty casual. I like to keep them casual and interactive. So this is just a table. We kind of um, went through, uh, again, I'm not sure how much, how many of you guys were here yesterday, but we wrote guidelines in 2014 really looking at sex differences in stroke and prevention me measures in stroke. And risk factors for stroke do differ in men and women. The big one, of course, is pregnancy because men don't get pregnant. Um, last time we checked, how do you? So, um, and you're exposed to hypertension and gestational diabetes. Birth control, also a risk factor for women not experienced by men. But there's also risk factors that are just much more prominent in women. So women are much more likely to have migraine. So we know that migraine with aura can be a risk factor for stroke. More women with high blood pressure. More women with atrial fibrillation. And again, part of this is aging. So these are age-related diseases. So the older you get, the more likely you are to have them. Um, and some risk factors probably impact men and women the same, but depression and psychosocial stress also seem to have a disproportionate effect in women. All right, so I always show this case because, you know, you always think about, well, you know, strokes are disease of the elderly. So this is one of the first cases we did um, in endovascular case. This is actually a college student, so she always gives me permission to show her picture. So she was um, a sophomore at Holyoke. Um, 20 years old, soccer player, really athletic, was sitting and her roommate was braiding her hair and she slumped over and she had a right hemiparesis and an aphasia. So where's her stroke? <laughs> so left MCA. So cortical because of the aphasia. Remember, you know, these are really important signs to look for in the endovascular era. You need to figure out if it's a large stroke or a little stroke. Cortical signs, left hemisphere aphasia, right hemisphere neglect, you should be thinking about an ICA or an MCA occlusion. And that means maybe you should be taking them to the cath lab. But anyway, this young girl was totally healthy. No problem. She didn't have a dissection or anything. Um, she got TPA, luckily, in the outside ER only because they had done a in-service. Because a lot of these people will show up, especially young women, in the ER and they'll be like, oh, it's drugs, or oh, she's crazy, or oh, she's malingering. So anyway, she, this is uh, one of our first first mercy cases, so here's her, her um, angiogram, and here you can see just her skull film, and here's the mercy, and that's actually deployed in the left MCA, and here's her angiogram pre and post device, and of course we don't really use the mercy anymore, uh, we use other devices, they're a little bit better, um, but you can see she had restoration of flow, this is her clock coming out, so then you ask yourself, well why this young, and she ended up with a very small stroke, and is actually a speaker for the American Heart now, and goes around about stroke in women and stroke in young women, so you say, well why did this 20 year old healthy soccer player have a stroke, and it turns out on her workup, she was on birth control and had recently gotten started on birth control. So this is something you should always ask your patients. Recent pregnancy, recent starting on a birth control pill. But remember, the risk from birth control <laughs> is very low, especially with the new formulations that only use 35 micrograms of estrogen. So, um, but it does increase with age. So for older women, 
really should be avoided. Like there's still women on birth control after 40, 45, and we know that that significantly increases risks. Um, if you're a smoker over 35, you shouldn't be prescribing it um, because it's just going to put you at risk. Okay, um, a new a new guideline that came out in 2014 is that when you start a woman on birth control, and this is important for the PCPs and OBGYNs to know, they should get screened um, a couple months later after starting it for hypertension because it can induce hypertension in, in some patients. Okay, so migraine with aura, also a female, so I'm trying to make this half-half clinical and then I'll get into the basic science. Um, if you have migraine, you're, you're at higher risk, especially if you have migraine with aura or you smoke. So be very cautious about um, oral contraceptions in patients with migraine with aura, especially if you're going to use a lot of triptans. Um, and it's really should be avoided in migraineurs that smoke. If they have hemiplegic migraine, I would not use it. Don't use oral birth control. Now, hormone replacement, I just wanted to touch briefly on this. We talked a little bit about it yesterday, but because this new data came out in the past week, I just want to mention it to you. Um, this was in the New England Journal, well, actually two weeks ago. Um, so basically, we always thought hormones, and I'll, I, and I'll get to it back to it from a basic <laughs> science perspective, because this is actually where I started in the lab, is looking at how estrogen could protect. And we would give males estrogen and give them a stroke, and the stroke would be smaller. And in clinical studies, observational studies, you look at women who were on hormone replacement therapy and they had lower incidence of stroke and heart disease. So everybody said, well, estrogen must be protected. Also, women don't have as many strokes until they get to 20 years post-menopause. So we must be protected. What's different between men and women? Well, one factor is gonadal hormones. Men having androgens, women having estrogens. So they started looking at this and <clears throat> Um, basically, we've shown in the lab, like many other people have, is if this is a this is a crescent violet coronal stain of a mouse brain, and actually this one may be a rat. And here you see in the basal ganglia, this is the corpus callosum, just for your mouse anatomy, and this is cortex. Um, you see a little pallor here in the basal ganglia, that's the infarct. If you take out the ovaries and remove estrogen and progesterone, and it seems to be more estrogen than progesterone, I won't get into that story, you see how huge the infarct gets, a very large infarct with a lot of edema and a lot of inflammation. So, oh yeah, estrogen must be protective. So we should give women estrogen. So the first trial they did was in secondary prevention in women who had established heart disease, they gave them estrogen, and we had higher fatal stroke rates. So that didn't work. So they said, well, that's because they have atherosclerosis, and they're pro-coagulable, and they have pro-inflammatory. So we need to give it we need to give it to healthy women. So in the Women's Health Initiative, they gave estrogen or estrogen plus a progestin to healthy women with no history of stroke or heart disease. And you can see here that in the hormone arms, the women had higher incidence of stroke. So completely not what we expected. We thought estrogen would protect. No, it actually made people worse. And it turns out that's the current guideline, but I think this guideline's probably gonna change um, in the next year based on some of the emerging data, is for women with stroke or TIA based on um, trials, for secondary prevention, you should not use hormone ther therapy. And it's now not recommended for primary therapy. but um, it turns out that there were a lot of problems with the Women's Health Initiative. A lot of women did have vascular disease, and less than one-third of them were between the ages of 50 and 59. And they had a lot of contraindications to hormone therapy, smoking and other things. They were older. They were more commonly diabetic. The average age in the, in the WHI was like 61, 62, 63, whereas the average age of menopause is 51. So these women had gone a decade without any gonadal hormones at all, and then we gave them a big dose of gonadal hormones, and oh, look, it made them procoagulable. Okay, it actually increased their CRP levels and stuff. So we started an average of 12 years post-menopause. So probably not, so this became like the whole timing hypothesis of estrogen. That if you're going to get beneficial effects on the vasculature and brain from estrogen, that you need to start it pretty early after menopause. You don't want to go for a long period without any estrogen at all. And if you look at the data, there's some hint of this. This is a Cochrane review from 2015 that looks at women that were given estrogen prior, 10 years prior, or 10, in the period 10 years after menopause versus greater than 10 years. And it does appear that there may be a slight benefit or not as big of a risk in women who were started within 10 years. 
And so that brought up this paper, which just came out, and where they looked at the vascular effects of early estrogen. So basically they said, well, we did that trial wrong. That was a stupid trial. Like, we know estrogen can be pro-inflammatory, so why did we wait so long? Why did, so looking back, we should design our trial better. So what they did in this trial is they initiated estrogen replacement within six years of the menopause or after 10 years. And because this group um, is much younger, they don't look at stroke as an, out, out, uh, as, a, as an outcome, right? So the average age of stroke in most case series for women are 72, 73. So these women are getting started on hormone therapy within six years of menopause. They're in their 50s. So we'll have to wait and see what the actual stroke risk is 20 years from now when women are at high risk. So they use carotid intimate thickness as a surrogate marker, and they found that if you were started, and these guys had lower CIMT to begin with because they're younger than this group, because that group was started within 10, or after 10 years, and they found that early estrogen did indeed slow atherosclerosis. So, um, and this is important only because this is what I was talking about, translational stroke research. So that trial was not designed very well because when you look at the people who are using estrogen therapy, they were younger, observational. They started estrogen therapy because they were having hot flashes, right? So it started right at menopause. So you go back to the lab and you take, and this is somebody uh, in my lab, Fudong Lu, did this work, and he basically took mice and he... Um, started estrogen either at like 15 months, so that's about animals become kind of menopausal at 14 months. So they took um, animals at 14 months and then he started replacing them with estrogen at about 15 months, gave them a stroke at 20 months. Or he waited, didn't replace them, and then replaced them with estrogen two weeks before the stroke. The animals that had been replaced all along that never had a period where they got really hypogonadal were protected by estrogen, whereas, and had smaller strokes, whereas the ones that got estrogen two weeks before actually had bigger strokes and more inflammation. So we could predict the results of the WHI based on preclinical studies, but nobody ever really kind of paid attention to it. So it probably wasn't the best trial design, and now we have to go back and kind of do the trial again the way it probably should have been done. And this is important because now I'll get a little bit more into like age and the basic science. So. Again, women really take off here. Mm -hmm. So before you go yeah. this, I, I wanted to ask, your picture of your mouse or your rat mm -hmm. was pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Is there any equivalent of that in human women? No, do but that's a... remove the ovaries in women? Do they have worse strokes? So that's a great, great question. And the answer is we don't really know. Because you can do surgical ovarectomy, or, you know, if women need to have, like, a, a ovarectomy for whatever reason, a hysterectomy plus ovarectomy. Um, those, the incidence of stroke is still really low in those women because the age makes such a difference. So the incidence of 40-year-olds having stroke, whether it's with or without ovaries, is pretty low. That's true in men, too. Um, there's some suggestion that women who've had early menopause may have a higher incidence of stroke. It also gets complicated because in clinical populations, you're talking incidence, naturally occurring stroke, whereas in the lab, we're inducing a stroke. So you need huge numbers to follow in these big epidemiological trials. But it does look that if, like, if you've had early, early menopause or you have an um, uh, ovarectomy, that your risk of stroke is higher. There isn't that much data on the size of the stroke. <clears throat> so um, age really matters. Age affects stroke. It's the biggest risk factor for stroke is aging. Um, and, and we'll get into a little bit of this kind of new concept that so age, like what can you do, right? You get older. Non, the non-modifiable risk factor for stroke. Well, I'll tell you what, there's some really interesting preclinical data that suggests that aging may also be a modifiable risk factor. Um, so I'll, I'll explain it. So, and uh, really it's people who at Stanford who started this whole concept of reducing age-related inflammation and age rejuvenation. Basically what they did is they did a model, which I'm not going to talk about, which we do in our lab, um, called heterochronic parabiosis, which is where you take a young animal and you sew it to an old animal. They get sewn together. So it looks, you know, actually after a few days they're very happy. Um, and you, after about five weeks, 
they share systemic circulation. So you leave them around for a month, and they actually develop vascular anastomosis. So you can take a GFP positive mouse, a green fluorescent protein positive mouse, where all the cells are labeled with GFP, and you sew it to a wild type mouse. Within five weeks, about half of the cells in the wild type mouse are GFP positive because they're transmitted across those anastomoses. And it turns out if you do that and you look at the brain um, of a of a strain of an animal that has Alzheimer's, for example, or has an amyloid, you see reduced amyloid in the old mouse. You can see increased neurogenesis, and they've done a lot of screening to figure out what the compounds are that rejuvenate the brain. So we can talk a little bit about that too. We can tell me again the term combining the young so it turns so it probably there are either immune factors because the immune system can kind of be transmitted or cellular factors, like, so there were identified a few by proteomics, something called GDF11, growth differentiation factor 11 was one of them, um, and then they found some negative ones, CCL11 being a negative regulator of aging. So what they then did is they took, um, like, CCL11, for example, they made a recombinant protein and then injected it into young mice, and they found um, worse behavior. So they found cognitive deficits. By giving this factor for 30 days, they aged the animal. And they call it heterobiosis. Uh, so it's called heterochronic, meaning two different ages, parabiosis. Isochronic just means young, young, or old, old. So heterochronic means you do an old to a young. And what happens, and we do it in our lab, and we've been seeing, like, the um, young mouse gets, like, sucked up. Like all the factors, it gets kind of, yeah. The old mouse starts like taking many, many things from the young mouse. And I'll talk, and I'm not going to talk about it today, but we have another line of research, and I would have gone on forever, and you guys would have been like, oh my God, it's 8 o'clock, when is she going to shut up? No. So, I'm gonna, so the way we do it too is we've looked at the microbiome. So you guys know what the microbiome is? So it's all the commensals, it can be in your gut, and your skin, whatever. So the microbiome is the bacterial commensals that live in your body, and we know they outnumber our cells about 10 to 100 to 1, okay? So it turns out the microbiome we found ch changes after stroke. So other people have shown that the microbiome changes with age. So as you get older, and we don't know why, well, we now think we know why, the gut changes, and you get dysbiotic, so you get a uh, total different ratio of bacteria in the gut, and they're more um, endotoxin producing. Um, and the gut architecture starts to break down, which may kind of help these kind of pathogenic, more pathogenic bacteria kind of overflow your gut. So it's been known for some time that the aged gut is different than the young gut. What we found is after stroke, the animals looked aged. So their gut microbiome changed after stroke and was very similar to an age biome. Same pathogenic kind of species, same things that produce endotoxin, and that may be contributing to some of the death that we see um, in older animals and older people. They, they lose gut integrity and they get bacterial translocation of these pathogenic organisms to the mesenteric lymph nodes and it produces sepsis. So that's... Uh, that's coming out, I think, soon, um, looking at age-related changes. But what's even more interesting is if you take young biome and you do a fecal transplant, which everybody's like, eh, who does fecal transplants? So, so we do it all the time now, right, for C. diff, for pathogenic C. diff enteritis. They do um, biome transplants, you know, because it's refractory to antibiotics. So if you take a young biome and put it in an old animal, and what you'll see is the young, the old animal is rejuvenated. After about a month, they have better behavior, even without stroke. They're much less likely to die from their stroke, um, and they have better motor activity. If you take the old biome and you put it in a young animal, about 40% of them die after stroke, and we usually have like a 0% mortality. So there's something very toxic in the age biome that affects the host, and we've only done that over a month with these fecal transplants. So now we have to figure out, you know, how long does it take to get that gut-induced dysbiosis and impact stroke.
So aging occurs in the brain. So this is just an example. This patient obviously has, this one actually has amyloid. Um, but you can see these big sylvian fissures, all this atrophy, all this white matter change. But clearly the brain is really different. And a nice, young, healthy brain, plump, you know, small ventricles, and this brain. So we have to take this into account in our animal models. Like, why are we studying 12-week-old mice, right? I mean, 10-year-olds. So, you know, and does it matter? Are we moving too far? Like, are, are mice so different than humans that we shouldn't even use them as a model? No, I don't think so. We can learn a lot from animal studies. But using the closest animal that we can to the human disease. So I've moved all, almost all of our studies in our lab into aging animals. And I'll show you why it's really important. Okay, so issues in the use in animals of preclinical research. We don't model diabetes, obesity, high cholesterol, hypertension. We don't model any of those risk factors. Lifestyle, they're not in there, you know, using crack or whatever the mice do at night. They're having a party, but we don't really mimic the real world population. Um, and there's interaction between these risk factors and aging. And very interestingly, in aging mice, um, females are hypertensive and they have a metabolic syndrome, just naturally at 20 months. And they are obese. Um, you know, they're usually running about 45 grams instead of like 25 in a young animal. And they have a lot more fat. Yeah. So you can, you can do it with a non-invasive tail cuff. You just put a little tail thing over their tail. Or we like to do it with actual arterial uh, lines. Or you can put in implantable telemetries, uh, monitors, um, with a catheter in their aorta. And you can watch them for a month or two. So. Yeah, they're not loving that telemetry, though, because the telemeter itself is about this big, and the mouse is like this big, so, it's a, you know, it's kind of a big <laughs> surgery. But they tolerate it well. Um, so this is very important because this is a new policy, and it has to be in every grant submission starting last February. If you do not put this in, your grant will be returned without review. So it's called the rigor guideline. And now you have to at least detail what sex of animal you're doing and why you excluded one sex. And I think this is really important. But you got to ask the NIH, well, are you going to double my budget? So part of the problem with this policy, of which I was pretty involved in generating, is now people are going to do these underpowered studies looking at tiny numbers of small numbers of animals and females, that, especially with stroke. If you stroke an animal, so mice and rats have about a four-day estrus. If you stroke them when they're in high estrus, they have a small stroke. If you stroke them when they're in low estrus, they have a big stroke. So there's a lot of variability unless you control for estrogen or, like me, avoid it completely by looking at age models. So I'm not sure how this policy is going to work out, but it's there. And you have to just say, okay, well, I didn't use females because I'm studying prostate cancer. Well, then you're good. So you, that's a reasonable thing, right? But a lot of times people weren't even reporting what sex the animals were. So, you know, who cares? Does it matter? So it matters in clinical translation, and it probably matters at the bench, too. So in, in uh, clinical work in 1993, they did the exact same thing that we just did with animals in humans. However, they're still not required to use women in phase one and two in a lot of trials. And many of the side effects of drugs are disproportionately affecting women. So I don't know if you guys heard about the Ambien thing. So now Ambien, which is a 60 Minutes thing by Larry Cahill, they, they did a very interesting thing. They were finding that Ambien, the sleep aid, that women were falling asleep at the wheel and having car accidents the next day. And it was known, and it's in the package insert, that the metabolism differs in women. And it's not just weight. It's metabolic pathways. And so now Ambien comes in a blue and a pink pill. So I think it's going to happen more and more. So also, we see it in preclinical. So the model we use, we use a lot of different models, but this is our kind of go-to model. This is a reversible middle cerebral artery occlusion. It gives a big stroke, which is why some people complain about it. We use smaller models, too. But this one's pretty standard, and it, and it does model the MCA stroke pretty well. So here's the circle of Willis in a mouse. Okay, and here's the MCA. So you just put a suture in here, and you put it right at the bifurcation here, and block blood flow. And you get a pretty big stroke that I think resembles MCA. So here's 
the stroke over time. This white area is infarct, the pink is, is alive, and usually it starts in the striatum or subcortical tissue, and then will extend out into the cortex. And usually by 24 to 72 hours, the stroke's pretty mature histologically. All right, so why do we care about sex differences? So this is some of our very early work, and I'm not going to go through it because you'll just glaze over and go to sleep. So this is oxygen glucose deprivation, which is stroke in a dish. These are neurons, either generated from males or females. You know, this is just one of our early studies. We've done it in hippocampal slices. We've done it in rats. We've done it in mice. We've done it in splenocytes. We've done it in other people have done it in astrocytes. We've done it in endothelium. And this is not unique to neurons. So what happens is if you look over time at oxygen glucose deprivation and the degree of ischemia, males are more ischemic sensitive than females. These are just neurons in a dish. Some are XX, some are XY. So like, like well, that's kind of cool. So females are kind of protected. So what does that mean? Do the females eventually catch up? Yes. Um, but, you know, when can we intervene? So after about 10 years of work, we've come up with this little thing. And this is just a simplified schematic. Um, this is what we propose as kind of the female predominant cell death. Seems to be mediated mostly by caspases um, with cytochrome C release and then caspase activation. Why are females set up this way? We think it may have something to do with this little molecule, which is X-linked inhibitor. Sorry, I bootlegged this from my own review. Um, X-linked inhibitor of apoptosis. That is the chief primary endogenous inhibitor of apoptosis. It's on the X chromosome. So you say, so what? Women have XX, men have XY, but one of the Xs is inactivated because you need genetic balancing. But like I told you yesterday, about 20% of the genes on the second X chromosome are transcribed. And although it might be shriveled up, then it can unshrivel. And all these epigenetic regulators, HDAX, and all these things probably influence the genetic expression of the second X chromosome, something we kind of completely ignored. Um, so anyway, we think that females die predominantly by caspases, whereas males die by more caspase independent cell death. So this is kind of the traditional, what we call PARP, or apoptosis inducing factor. So this is a little factor that's released from the mitochondria. When the cell gets ischemic, it dumps out this factor, which then, um, you know, is very toxic. You see PARP activation, which is a DNA repair enzyme. So in cell, if, when the cell dies, what happens? It starts to chop up its DNA. PARP is activated trying to repair the DNA. It can't repair the DNA because it has no blood, it has no oxygen, it has no energy. So the cell just kind of gets into this death spiral, okay? And that causes mitochondrial failure, AIF translocation from the mitochondria to the nucleus and cell death. But that predominantly occurs in males, whereas this occurs in females. And I'll tell you, they both occur almost equally in both sexes. So we're like, okay, what we first found is looking at mice that had knockouts of neuronal nitric oxide, which is the inducer of this pathway, or PARP, what we found is that the males were protected. So when you delete one of these, PARP, for example, or AIF, the males did better, but the females did worse. So we were like, hmm, okay. So we came up with that model that and it matters, because if you're going to target a neuroprotective therapy, you want to make sure that it works in both sexes, right? If we hadn't looked at the female mice, we never would have known that. We would have been like, oh yeah, PARP's great, the AIF inhibitor is great. And it is. It is for males, okay? And there's also sex differences. I don't know if you guys have heard of autophagy, but there's sex differences in that too. We, we That should be out soon. Um, so who cares? Like, this is all in a dish or mice, and who cares? What does it mean to me as a, as a stroke neurologist? So here is a drug called minocycline. You may have heard of it. It's an antibiotic. It was in clinical trial for ischemic stroke. It's a PARP inhibitor. It works anti-inflammatory, and it also inhibits PARP. So here's a coronal section. This is a stroke in a male who gets minocycline. It's actually productive. Look what happens in an overectomized female. Nothing. Okay, nothing. So what does that mean? Well, the minocycline trial was not powered. The one we did here in the U.S. was empowered to look at sex-specific analysis. There was no net benefit. But recently, they repeated the trial and did a sex-specific analysis of a minocycline trial in um, Europe. And what they found? Protected males, no effect in females. 
So is it a good idea to throw out minocycline as a norprotectant? No. You just have to know who to give it to. Okay? So this could matter, some of the stuff that we find in the lab. All right, I'm going to briefly mention social isolation. I know I talked about it yesterday. I'll talk a little bit more about the mechanism. So we know that social isolation increases the risk of mortality as much as smoking and hypertension. Like, um, it independently increases stroke risk and it, it leads to poor recovery, and it increases recurrent stroke risk. So being isolated. And you can live alone and not be isolated. So you have to be very careful with your definition in people. Just because you live alone, do you feel like lonely? Does it stress you out? You know, like I was saying yesterday, I have four kids. I like a little isolation. You know, it's, it's good for me. So you have to really have a subjective loneliness kind of component, and that seems to cause inflammation. Okay, um, so in women, and this may be part of the reason elderly women do so but poorly, is over half of the women live alone after the age of 80. They've been widowed, they're widowed, the ones that are living independently at home instead of in assisted living. They've outlived their spouses. There are numerous targets for the detrimental effects of isolation, but we haven't really figured out what they are. Um, so we know in that in both humans and animal models that um, NF-kappa B and pro-inflammatory signaling like IL-6 contributes to social isolation. We're actually now trying to find out how it works at a, John, just so you know, a microglial signature, looking at epigenetic regulators of microglial polarization. So it seems to affect brain inflammation. But if you take, so you can say, do you feel isolated? There's all these other factors. Are you, are you lonely? Are you compliant with your meds like we talked about? In humans, it's very hard to define what is isolation. And there's so many other factors, genetic factors, polymorphisms, compliance, smoking, obesity. So what's very interesting, though, is you can model this in the laboratory. So you can take, so this is different, sorry. So you can take two animals that are pair housed and you separate them two weeks before stroke and the stroke is twice as large. So it's really fundamental. Those are the same mice, same genetic strain, same risk factors and the stroke is twice as large if they're isolated. So we thought that was really interesting. A lot of the targets that we found are things like nf kappa B and inflammation. But if you're a neurologist, you don't know if they're isolated until they come to you with their stroke. So can we somehow manipulate isolation to enhance recovery after stroke? And here's our first work where we looked at isolated animals and stroke uh, pair housed with a stroke partner or pair housed with a healthy partner. And these animals were separated three days after stroke. So then, remember that section I showed you, the coronal section of the mouse brain, that it was pretty complete by three days? So the infarct is actually exactly the same in these animals because the infarct damage is kind of done by three days, right? So they all have the same degree of infarct. But the isolated animals just died and died and died and died. 30 days later, it had nothing to do with the stroke. They just continued to die. Um, and now, which, yeah. Isolated, but like just by themselves. By themselves, yep. So they were in pairs beforehand. They had their stroke. They were returned to their pair, and then they were isolated three days later. The other one where I said that the stroke was 50% bigger, those were isolated three days or a week prior to stroke. So that it seems to increase your baseline inflammatory thing. This clearly affects mortality. You know, we're trying to figure out why. Are they immune suppressed? Are they getting more infections? Um, and interestingly with these animals, if you put them in with another animal, they're kind of like an aphasic patient. They actually withdraw. So if you put them in an interaction chamber, if they're pair housed and they're stroke, they still interact with each other despite their hemiparesis or they circle a little bit, especially as the animal recovers. In an animal that's isolated, they actually become progressively isolated. So you put them in with another mouse to interact and they don't interact. They just go hide in the corner. They just actually withdraw more. They have depressive type phenotypes on testing and, um, and they look, uh, you know, on sucrose consumption. They don't drink as much sucrose. They have anhedonia. So, is this uh, uh, male, female? So that's a great, great question. So these are males. It turns out the effect is even more dramatic in females. And that's something we're just starting to Yes. Well, no, so we're using, so th these, are, these are young, but we use aged animals, but it's a good point. So, and actually, I just heard from um, 
a collaborator who studies progeria. Do you guys know what progeria is? It's like that pro-aging thing. There's actually a mouse model of it, and they die about like four months because they just age and age and age, and it's probably a hell of a lot cheaper than my animal care bills, keeping them alive for 18 months, you know, and housed. So these guys age really fast. Um, and he found that if you put that animal in with a wild type, their lifespan was like a third longer. And why is that? Are they behaviorally interacting? But it comes back to maybe it's the microbiome, right? Because mice are corpophagic. So are we are we changing the biome? And so does it matter in the pairs? Kind of uh, going further into John's question, if it was male, female separated, or male, male It doesn't separated. seem to matter. So we did over, in our earlier studies 10 years ago, because this is a project that's been going on for about 10 years, at Hopkins, we use both over-ectomized females with a male. You don't want to use a non-over-ectomized females, otherwise you then have lots of overcrowding because they have pups, you know. So then there's no isolation anymore. There's like, you know, a, a litter or two. So you have to over-ectomize over them, and it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. But the detrimental effects of isolation are more pronounced in female mice. And there's some question about, you know, like you don't want to put an aid, you don't want to put a mouse in with another like male partner because then they could be aggressive and they can fight and that in itself is stressful. And they know, Courtney DeVries has done some really great work on this, is males putting them in together, if they're stranger males, they're not happy at all. And in fact, that makes their stroke bigger because of the stress and it um, uh, increases uh, cortisol or corticosterone signaling. So... Um, so they do have this depressive phenotype on a tail suspension. They just kind of hang there. They don't try and like right themselves. And we think most of this is due to effects on growth factors like uh, BDNF, which is really tightly tied to both stroke recovery and depression. So BDNF levels get lower with isolation and stroke, and they can be restored to almost baseline. Um, we've seen this in aged animals. I didn't show the females, but it's the same. That if you separate them before the stroke, their stroke is again bigger. Here's an isolated animal, and here's a pair housed animal, um, and their behavior is worse. So this is not unique to young animals. And the mechanism may be a little bit different in age, though, because it turns out that age causes a pretty big decrease in BDNF and growth factors anyway. Okay, it's associated with aging. They seem to have um, differences in their myelin recovery and their myelinization and their ability to remyelinate. So myelin basic protein lo uh, uh, levels are, are kind of enhanced with pair housing. All right. Please, mm -hmm. if, if you isolate the mice and then bring them back into assisted living <laughs> and then give them a stroke. Yes. Is, it, is this effect reversible? It probably is, but that's a great question. We've never checked. Yeah. You would hope that it is, right? That, so that's one of the things that's hard to model, right? So the biggest trial that they ever did, because this is not like new, like the cardiologists are always a little bit ahead of us in certain things. So they've known that social isolation impacts heart disease recovery that, and increases recurrent stroke. I mean, a recurrent heart attack. So what they did is they did a big trial called the ENRICH trial in patients with heart disease. And what they did is they sent all these social supports out to call them, how you doing, and visited the house, and it made absolutely no difference. So a very expensive um, intervention. But it turns out they did it for everybody. They didn't actually give a questionnaire to say, are you lonely? Like, if you're not lonely, it could be pretty annoying to have somebody calling you or coming to your house, right? So you, you got to think about that. So one of the things we're trying to do in our clinical models, because we have a clinical kind of program that we're trying to get off the ground with this, is get serum biomarkers, see if they have a biomarker signature or probably a microRNA signature, which is really what we're doing, of loneliness. And if we can figure out what that is, then we can stratify patients appropriately into an intervention trial. And that's what makes sense. It's like the WHI. Like, try, you can't just take all comers. Like, some people like to live alone. Some people don't like to be bothered, right? So it has to have a negative consequence, either on a questionnaire or a biomarker or something. And you've got to use targeted therapies. So that's what we're trying to come up with because doing another social intervention trial is probably going to be futile unless you really figure out who you who you should intervene in. Okay, going back to your studies about um, uh, metaphors, mm -hmm. and, uh, stroke risk, is it not? Are we focusing on 
Hormones and we should be focusing on life. We should be, that's the whole point. Is and exactly because, we, and that's the whole thing about age and sex, is they're impossible to kind of extricate each other because as women age, they not only have gonadal senescence, but they're also very likely to be isolated and they get more frail, and all of these factors contribute, which is why I think you got to use the appropriate animal model. Right? So for me, I think sex differences are really interesting. And it turns out some of these sex differences are patterned so early in utero. So I didn't talk about it because it's really complicated. But we have a, um, a project looking at a thing called the four core genotype mice. And those mice are very useful to figure out what's sex and what's hormones. Because the mice have SRY. SRY is the testes determining gene in mammals, including men, men, mice, all the same. If you get SRY, you develop testes, you produce testosterone, and you're male. SRY is on the Y chromosome. Makes sense. You inherit your Y, you get the SRY, you develop testes. But in this animal model, we've taken SRY off the Y chromosome and put it on chromosome 3. I think it's 3. Good. Yes. So now you can make XY females because they get the Y chromosome, but the SRY has been removed. So they default and they get horm they get ovaries and they produce estrogen and they can actually have an offspring. You can also make XX males because they inherit the chromosome three with the Y chromosome. So they develop testes. So it gets really complicated then. But it turns out in young animals, it's the hormones. If you have estrogen, you're protected. So if you don't get the SRY, you make ovaries, you make estrogen, you have smaller stroke. In aged mice, it's all chromosomes. So it turns out if you develop, if you um, get the XX, you're protected. And it doesn't have as much to do with hormones. So it really... What bathroom did they go to? Exactly. They go to the one with a dress and the, like, ball cap. I don't know. <laughs> they can go to any bathroom. That's the, that's the, that's the joy of, you know, these uh, transgender mice. North Carolina. Exactly. Are there changes in the microbiome uh, in sexes? Yes, that's a great question. And, um, in fact, that was one of the first papers on microbiome is um, Dansk, um, who's from Canada, Canada, I think, found that there's a sex difference in type 1 diabetes development in these nod mice. And the fem I think the females get it and the males don't. And she found out it was due to the biome. She did biome transplants and increased the rate of diabetes. Um, so there's something specific about the biome and what steroids they probably produce. So these commensals may have an effect both in the gut themselves or they may secrete something that affects these diseases. I guess I was just pushing more at you know, the same sex and um, age, but there's also social. Problems. There's gender. You can't get rid of it. That's gender. Yep. Yep. You know, yep. And, and, it, and many more women have depression. And in, in the older age groups, many more women. So you're right. There's a that's why it's so difficult. That's why you like to use mice, right? They're the same gene. They're the same exposure. They're all black C57. You know, so that's the nice way you can control for some of these factors. Um, pregnancy. We I showed you guys this one yesterday. Do you guys remember what this is? Anybody there yesterday? So thunderclap headache, postpartum, multiple. RCVS, yes. So this is one of the things that you can see. There's a lot now we know about um, pregnancy-related vasculopathies. This happens to be one of them. I showed you her angiogram. Here's her little kind of very kind of constriction. And, you know, she's got segmental narrowing, which is gone um, after a few months. Okay? A microchondrism, I'm not even going to talk about this. We talked about it yesterday. So I'm going to, because I have a head. So we're going to talk about neuroimmunology now in the last like 10 minutes. Sorry, guys. So we started getting very interested in the systemic effects of stroke. This is some um, stuff that was started by Keith Pennypacker looking at the spleen response to stroke, but it's kind of true for many immune organs and many kind of like the bone marrow. So if you give a stroke in the right side of the brain to, an, to the animal, you'll see a response, a proliferative and myelopoietic response from the right femur. So there's probably some communication, and this is probably true with spleen. So this is actually young animals. This is the thymus, okay? And 72 hours after stroke, you can see it's all tiny. This is the spleen, and it involutes and dumps out all its cells 72 hours after stroke. Interestingly, though, when you talk about age, you don't have a thymus. You can't even find it in an old animal. 
Because, and you don't have naive T cells very much. That's why old people don't immunize very well, because most of their T cells have been exposed to an antigen, right? And if, if you try and find the thymus, either in people or in mice, you can't really find it. Um, spleen, the splenic response is muted in the aged animal. So it's important. So here's like a fat pad in an aged animal and a young animal. So all these adipokines and pro-inflammatory factors, you can see how much more there'd be in, the, in this animal, okay? Um, we now know in the age brain that just in the baseline brain, you don't see many leukocytes, but they do, or, or lymphocytes trafficking in and out of the brain. It's supposed to be immune privilege. Turns out the brain has things trafficked through it all the time. And now there's this new glymphatic system, which may kind of allow for some of these immune cells to traffic through the brain. Very few... Um, leukocytes in the young brain, but in the age brain, and this isn't really due to blood-brain barrier breakdown, you see a lot more of these CD3 positive T cells, okay? And you don't really see them at all in young, but you see them in aged. If you look at um, these cells, so this is just flow cytometry, this is CD45 high, so these are, are peripheral cells. These are CD45 intermediate, so they're microglia. So in a young male mouse, you'll see, here's the microglia, and then you'll see some scattered cells here. You see how many more are in the age brain. These are those T cells. And surprisingly, we thought they were going to be CD4 T cells, but they're CD8 T cells. And it turns out these T cells have um, a biological signature that seems to secrete IL-17, which is a neutrophil chemotoxin. So I'll explain why that's important. So Age mice, despite having very high um, mortality, and we fixed this because initially when we were first starting these studies, with a 90-minute stroke, 50% of the age mice would die, you know, and, and they just continue to die. But if you look at their stroke, here's the stroke in the young, and here's the stroke in the age. The stroke was smaller, so why are they all dying? So we were trying to figure that out. We found a lot more hemorrhages in our aged animal. And this is true. This is an, an embolic clot model where we clot off the MCA with the clot. But they had a lot more of this hemorrhage. And you know, one of the big risk factors for hemorrhage is aging, like after TPA. Okay, um, you know, hemorrhage into a stroke, you can see it with cardioembolic strokes. So then we wanted to look at what, what, what was going on in the brain, what cells were going into the brain and trafficking. And again, young sham, you don't see that many leukocytes, mostly microglia. If you have a stroke, the blood-brain barrier gets completely shellacked. The stroke, like I showed you here, is big. So all of this area is infarcted, so there's a lot of area for these cells, these peripheral cells, to come in, okay? Most of these are lysis high, meaning they're inflammatory monocytes, like we were talking earlier. In the aged brain, though, you see a totally different response to stroke. You don't see quite as many peripheral cells coming in because the blood-brain barrier isn't actually as disrupted because the stroke is smaller. But the ones that are coming in are lysis G positive. So you get a predominantly neutrophil response in the aged, which you don't get in the young. What does that mean? Well, we know neutrophils are important in lots of different things, especially breaking down the blood-brain barrier, causing hemorrhage, MMP production. And what we found is these aged T cells that we had in the aged brain, they had these, these CD8 T cells, had um, these adhesion markers that let them get into the brain, and they secreted IL-17. Okay, which could pull in neutrophils. So we wanted to say, well, who cares? It's all very interesting, but can we manipulate it and see a difference? So we gen generated heterochronic, which you now know means old and young, uh, bone marrow chimeras. So you can take a GFP positive mouse and you can put in GFP into um, uh, positive bone marrow. So here's like, for example, a coronal section, and you see all these dots here, all this green? These are all the infiltrating leukocytes. We know they are because the bone marrow has been, um, is GFP positive because it's from a GFP positive donor. So you irradiate the mouse, you reconstitute its peripheral immune cell with GFP. So these all kind of go in and infiltrate here. So what we did is we made a young young, so we put young bone marrow into young host. We put old bone marrow into a young host. We took young bone marrow into an old host and old into old. So these are the, just the controls for things like radiation and things like that. And what we found is that if you give a young animal aged bone marrow, instead of having you know, a good recovery with low neurological deficit scores, so the lower, this, the lower this is, these are all little dots, these are all one animal, 
the, um, the better they do. So this is a young animal given young bone marrow. This is an old animal, um, uh, you know, a uh, young animal given old um, bone marrow. And their deficits are much worse. Their infarct wasn't different. So we didn't influence the infarct size, but we worsened their behavior. And what we found is in the ones that were given old marrow, they started to have a more neutrophilic response. So they were also pulling in neutrophils. If you give young, probably the more translational relevant thing is can we make old people better? So if you give young bone marrow to an old mouse, they get better. Their behavior deficit goes from like a four or three down. So giving the young marrow made the aged mouse better. And again, no effect on infarct, but you saw a big increase um, in behavioral testing. This just happens to be one of them. We saw it on a bunch of different behavioral tests. And interestingly, we found that young bone marrow made the old animal look better even without a stroke. They ran around more. They had stronger grip strength. So even in sham, using the old, using the young marrow and rejuvenating the peripheral immune system made the aged animals better. Um, and we found that, that giving young animals the aged bone marrow, we saw a higher rate of MMP, okay, which is a breakdown, can break down extracellular matrix. Um, we saw higher levels, and we saw higher levels in the neutrophils. Um, and look what happened with old, old. We had a lot of this hemorrhage. I told you a lot of the, the old animals got a lot of this punctate hemorrhage. If you gave them young marrow, we saw a significant reduction in the amount of hemorrhage. Yeah, so you can head shield. Um, so we'll often head shield. Oh, sorry, I'm walking. Head shield. Um, but that's why we use the young, young, and the old, old. Those are simply controls for the bone marrow, for the antibiotics, for for the radiation. Okay. Question? Have you talked to people doing BMT about head shielding the patients who are getting BMT? We have not. Has anybody looked at stroke in and we know, no, but we know that radiation to the head is bad, right? It can cause vasculopathy. It can actually cause direct neuronal or delayed neuronal cell death. Um, but it's a good point, yeah. So, I mean, usually when they're radiating people, they protect them unless they're radiating their head for, like, a glioma. And then you can't really avoid the radiation. But, um, but yeah, it turns out that, you know, we've always said that microglia are pretty radio-resistant, which is one of the ways you make bone marrows to try and figure out if it's a monocyte, like a peripheral myeloid cell, or microglia. So if you radiate them or you deplete them, uh, the peripheral cells will turn over every three to four days. The microglia are very long-lived and are pretty radio-resistant. So a lot of people don't head shield. But that's why we did the old, old, young, young, because then that controls for, because, you know, you do a lot of things with bone marrow transplant, right? You got to give them antibiotics, they get really immune suppressed, they could pick up viruses. So you really want to control, but it adds a considerable amount of numbers to your, to your design. But that does control for those factors. And that's why I like looking at some of the things that we're going to find in these bone marrow, some of our targets, we got to see if they're also the same as in our biome studies and in our heterochronic parabiosis. So each model has a plus and a minus. So a heterochronic parabiosis, they don't have any radiation. So if we find the same thing, we know it's not related to radiation, but heterochronic parabiosis is pretty tough. You know, you're sewing two animals together. So some people may say, well, well sir, you know, surgical stress. With the microbiome, people We'll say, well, it's because you blasted the initial host biome with antibiotics, and that can change stroke. We know it can. Kira's done work on that. So, you know, each of these models, if you can find a kind of common signature in them that work in all three, those are probably the targets we want to explore. So that's why we're using bone marrow um, to kind of figure out, like, how can we rejuvenate, um, you know, using the immune system. Um, so that's kind of it. I didn't kind of go into great details, but it's it's dramatic. I mean, it's dramatic. You, we have films of these mice, and you know, these it takes about five weeks to repopulate, six weeks to repopulate, and it's the same with the biome, about a month. But these animals look different. You can tell the ones that got the young marrow or the young biome. They 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 look healthier. It's kind of scary, you know, and it kind of, and, and now, like, because of some of the work that was done in California with some of these blood transfer, plasma transfer exchanges, they're actually now doing a trial, it's not, I don't think it's NIH approved or anything, where they're actually giving 
plasma to Alzheimer's patients from young patients, from young donors. And I'm like, that's dangerous, man. <laughs> you know, you don't know what other infections those people can have. If you have established Alzheimer's, if you have a brain that, you know, that old withered looking brain, it, that's going to be pretty hard to like get back. So, you know, we need to come with some preclinical or early clinical kind of testing for dementia. And then maybe some of these rejuvenating things will, will work. But it, it was amazing to me that just by restoring the, bi the biome or the bone marrow that you could change stroke outcome. And you can. All right, so translational research, we should target mechanisms and develop therapies using appropriate animal models. We need to do behavior. I, I like looking at things like cognitive behavior in mice. And mice, it's also kind of scary, can do a tremendous amount. Like, so I was in Lille in France last year when I saw this, and she actually talked in that session, uh, Julie, and she found that you can actually train a mouse to use an iPad and, like, poke a picture of a plane. I'm like, oh, you know, I always thought they were like not so smart, but they can distinguish between like a schematic of a flower and a schematic of a plane and poke its nose. Anyway, um, so we really need to translate to clinical trials and we need to have, you know, these people work together to design what's a rational clinical trial. Um, so sex-specific risk factors requiring special attention. A lot of this was really more covered yesterday. Pregnancy, hormones, migraine, hypertension, AFib. Remember in your Chad's vast too, you get a point just for being a woman. So everybody knows that AFib embolic risk is higher in a woman. We know it. it's in our scales. Um, acknowledge the burden of, of stroke on older women, and it is now killing a tremendous number of women, many more than breast cancer. And it's dropped to the fifth cause of death in men, but it's probably upping to almost the second in women. So there's this big sex-specific kind of sex disparity, especially in elderly patients. Oh, and these are, these are some of my kids, because they always say, Mom, you never show us pictures. Yeah, you never show our picture. But anyway, so here's a picture of my kids. It looks like they're doing, they're not all mine. <laughs> Just this one's mine, and this one's mine, and this one's mine. And then I realized, looking at this picture, it kind of looks like they're giving you the finger. I'm like, maybe this isn't the, but what they're doing is this, which is called, I guess, the dab, which is like some, is it the dab, or something. Some like hot new kid dance move. So I always tell my, my kids, I'm going to show a picture of you today. They're like, that's good because we never see you, and you've forgotten what we look like. But those are my kids. And uh, that's it. All right, I know we went kind of late. We're at the hour. Does anybody have any questions? I'm uh, just going to ask you this latest bone marrow data. I mean, you can comment on, you know, the stem cell transplants and stroke, they just really haven't shown a whole lot. They have not. So far, what is your take on that? So it would be really interesting because these are bone marrow transplants where there's a continual supply of these stem cells, like the mesenchymal stem cell um, human trials for stroke, and there haven't been that many. I mean, they give one or two doses. Maybe that's not enough, and maybe there's some slight efficacy signal, but doing the whole marrow, and in fact, that's where you would go with this, right? You would think, okay, we're going to, and what are you replacing with the bone marrow? You're replacing the young immune system, including the hematopoietic stem cell. So probably that, and putting it in the old marrow, is giving giving a kind of regenerative phenotype based on stem cell division and repopulating the marrow with young cells. But it's very interesting to me that the old bone marrow is so toxic. And ditto with the old biome. Like, the, oh my god, the young mice look terrible. So not only is there something that's good, whether it's a stem cell or growth factor in the young, there's also something really bad that's detrimental in the aged. But it would be interesting, you know, the question again, uh, the biome of male versus female, like, you know, currently with fecal transplant, no one is looking if it's going from male to female or male to male. Exactly. Um, so that's actually one of the things we're starting to do in the lab is taking old animals and young animals and seeing if there's also a sex difference. But you get into a tremendous number of animals and the NIH is already all over me because my budgets are so big because, you know, the aged animals for a classic R01, just the per diem in housing costs about 100000 $125,000 a year. It's incredibly expensive. So now you have like eight groups. You have male into female, female into male, age into young, young into age. So we're going to try and do one that's just looking only at, um, at age. But then the problem is, is probably the biome in both is quite toxic. So do we start with a young fecal transfer? So we just started looking at young females into young 
males. But we know most of this is hormones, so I think the hormonal effect in a young animal is going to overwhelm a lot of these other effects. What is it about the old biome? We don't know. We're doing proteomics and metabolomics screening. So that's actually the grant that I was writing today that's due Monday. It is not quite ready for prime time. Um, we actually have to do mass spec. We have to figure it out what's in there. So, it's, so you can ask yourself, well, what is it? Is it the bacteria? And the bacteria are completely different. They are like non-overlapping cat categories between bacterioroides and firmicutes. Okay? The ratio completely changes. There's also a lack of mucus, and the gut itself looks really different. So you don't know if it's the bacteria, the something the bacteria produce, like a ch short-chain fatty acid, like butyrate has been suggested, or is it a problem with the host and in the immune cells? Because remember, the gut mucosal immunity is probably one of the most important immune organs in the body. So what we've done so far is looked at these over a month. So the biome is completely replaced, and then we give it a month. So it could still be having effects on the host. And the same thing with the bone marrow. We could still be having an effects on the host. I think it's more immune in the bone marrow because you don't have time to rejuvenate all the vasculature. So, but that's what we got to figure out. Is it something in the bacteria itself? Is it the bacteria presenting an antigen to the host, or is it a bacterial product? And, you know, we're going to look at each of those. And interestingly, I never thought to do it, but we did it, and I just got the data from Venu. Um, if you give an MCA stroke, the gut's ischemic. Didn't know that. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. And we know that you lose gut integrity with stroke, but it turns out the gut itself, looking at this hypoxic diet, looks fantastic. The mucosal barrier is ischemic. They know even in my brain migraine is the gut doesn't work during the migraine. Yeah, so. and, and yeah, same thing with stroke. They get a lot of ileus, so the gut doesn't. So we don't know. There's such an interesting area, and the whole gut-brain axis is really unexplored, just like, you know, brain-spleen. How do these communicate? They communicate through the autonomic nervous system. So what are the signals? we got a long way to go to figure this out. That, I mean, could that just be a priming of the macrophages? Could, what would happen in a TLR knockout? Or a Don't TLR? know, and that's a great question because, you know, then you start saying, well, do we look at mucosal immunity? Do we look at gamma deltas or T regs or whatever? So last week, Ka Cytocolo came out with the first study on biome on ischemic stroke and found that it's the gamma delta T cells in the commensals reaction to the gamma delta T cells in the gut that seem to be um, uh, kind of modulating ischemic stroke outcome. It's cool stuff. I don't know what any of it means. It's good. It'll keep us busy for a few more years. Thanks for coming.